Hello, I'm Jennifer Potter, an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Women's Health Programs at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Fenway Health in Boston. It's my pleasure to be here today with Dr. Katie baratz dalk who is Chief Resident in the Department of Psychiatry at the Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Dalk, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're going to begin the interview talking about uh, what are differences in sex development. So differences in sex development is an umbrella term that's used to describe a whole host of congenital conditions that involve some variation in the way in which sex is determined. So um, this can happen at multiple levels throughout the process of sex development. So we see people with um, conditions such as Klinefelter syndrome, for example, where the uh, chromosomes, instead of being XY or XX, are XXY. Um, we see people who have variations in the way the gonads develop, people who have a combination of ovarian and testicular gonads, as in an ovotesticular difference in sex development. And then we can also see people who have variations in their external um, genital anatomy. So hypospadias, for example, where the urethra opens on, under the, um, on the underside of the penis instead of at the tip of the glands, or in um, XX uh, children with congenital adrenal hyperplasia who have enlarged clitorises. How do differences of sex development occur? So differences in sex development occur on a congenital basis, meaning that people are born with them. Um, some of them are inherited, and we see families, for example, where conditions like androgen insensitivity syndrome occur in many people in the family. Um, there are other instances in which there are also um, genetic conditions, but they're not inherited. So, for example, someone has a de novo genetic mutation that results in the formation. Um, or the development, rather, of a DSD, or difference in sex development. Um, other conditions, like hypospadias, for example, may not have a known genetic link and just occur spontaneously as a natural variation, just like anything else. I'm curious about the way that individuals with differences in sex development have been treated in the healthcare profession. So that's a, a rich and complicated story. Um, and we can sort of grossly divide it into three time periods. So prior to the 1950s, when a child was born with atypical genitals, um, really nothing was done to those children. Doctors sort of made a best guess as to what the gender of that child might be, and the child was raised in that way. Um, and it should be said, of course, that these conditions have been occurring forever. Mm -hmm. They didn't just magically start happening, <laughs> you know, post-World War II. Um, in the 1950s, however, there were two major medical and psychological developments that really changed the ways in which we manage these conditions. So the first was um, the development of surgical techniques that were capable of altering the external appearance of the genitals. Um, so the potential to do a vaginoplasty, for example, on a boy who had what was then called an inadequate penis, meaning inadequate for penetration of a vagina, um, or reducing the size of an enlarged clitoris. The other thing that happened concurrently was a psychological theory that was developed that was sort of called the gender of sex of rearing theory, this idea that um, gender, that children were a blank slate and that gender could be essentially imposed upon them. So if you took a child and you raised that child as a female and you never flagged in your assurance that that child was a female, regardless of what the child's anatomy was, they would be female. And there were some studies that backed this up at the time that have since really largely been discredited. So what ended up happening between the 1950s and really the 1990s is that children with atypical sex anatomy would have some sort of determination made to, as to what their best sex or gender might be. And a lot of that was determined based on what the surgical capability was at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it would be easier, for example, to create a vagina than to create a penis. Mm -hmm. And then the doctors and parents would relentlessly sort of raise that child in whatever the gender that had been determined was. And because there was worry that if you revealed any sort of conflicting or confusing information to the child that might challenge that gender identity, that information was withheld from people. So a lot of people grew up with a sense that their bodies were shameful, that their bodies were wrong or sick 
or ma malformed in some way. Um, they felt they could tell that doctors and parents were withholding information from them, although that was done with in the best interests of the child. It, it was a painful experience for a lot of individuals. And then in the 1990s, people started to get together and talk to each other, and the intersex, at the, as um, advocates called themselves at the time, intersex advocacy movement was born and really began to challenge this notion that information should be withheld from parents and began to challenge this notion that um, ability to accomplish heterosexual vaginal intercourse was the most important thing as opposed to fertility or sexual experience and really began to argue, well, why are we um, surgically altering children at all? So where we are now, in 2006, there was a major consensus statement that was published by a group of international providers that argues for disclosing information to, um, to parents and patients so that people have the most information available to them that they can, that argues for using surgery judiciously and being cautious about it, trying to make the best determination you can, preserve fertility as best you can, et cetera. Um, and so that's where we are today. There's still a lot of, of um, ground to be gained, I think, in terms of really making very thoughtful and consistent procedural sort of assessments and recommendations to people in an evidence-based way because the evidence base is still lacking. And in terms of disparities that currently continue to exist mm -hmm. for persons with DSD, can you say a little bit about that? And, and also maybe contrast those mm -hmm. with the kinds of disparities experienced by people who identify as LGB or T. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that trans individuals and DSD affected individuals have in common is that they are dependent on medical providers for treatment. So just as the transgender person needs to go to their doctor to get the hormones that they want to take to, to live in their affirmed gender, the DSD affected person also needs to go to the doctor to get the treatment that they might require as part of their condition. So that's something that trans and DSD affected people have in common that LG and B people may not experience in the same way. It's not linked to the letter, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean by that. Um, the, I think the other thing that is important to say is that this legacy of concealment and making determinations for patients without including patients in those determinations is something that many people with DSD still carry around with them um, and often go into a medical encounter already feeling as though that provider is not going to have their best interests at heart which is something I think that people in the LGBT community also share. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a, a sense of um, sort of deprivation of autonomy that distinguishes that experience from the sort of insensitive um, experience that people will receive otherwise. What things can healthcare professionals do to make the healthcare environment feel more safe and welcoming to persons with DSD? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the first thing is to educate themselves as much as possible mm -hmm. about DSD. They're, they're rare occurring conditions. We think that the, the best estimates that we have of people with visible genital difference is occurring about 1 in 1,500 to 1 in 2,000. People that meet some criteria for the broad different definition of a DSD is about one in a hundred, we think, but it's still a relatively rare occurring condition and many providers are not um, experienced in delivery of care to people with DSD. Um, I went to a pediatric endocrine society meeting several years ago where they um, polled pediatric endocrinologists about their experience treating one DSD androgen and sensitivity syndrome and the majority of subspecialists had treated fewer than three patients in their careers. Mm -hmm. um, so education is something that's really important. I think the other thing that's also very important is being aware that any sort of examination of a patient with a difference in sex development can feel to be intrusive and uncomfortable. And so just as you would explain to any patient, you know, we need to do this exam for this reason, 
it's especially critical in that context to say we need to look at your child's genitals so that we can see how they're developing and make sure they're developing the way we would expect them to, for example. And to include the child in the conversation when you have a, mm -hmm. a child patient. And the same thing with adults, making sure that people really understand why you're doing what you're doing and that you also think, is this something that's really essential mm -hmm. for the delivery of care for this patient? Mm -hmm. What, what do you think are some of the key concepts that we should be teaching our trainees about DSD? Mm -hmm. So I think the number one key concepts that patient, that students and trainees need to learn rather is that DSD is, so just as sex exists on a spectrum, sex is not binary, male or female, um, so does gender, sexuality, sexual identity, gender expression. And I think it's really important for trainees to understand that DSD does not imply some variation in gender identity or gender expression or sexual orientation. I think that's important, um, number one, because we don't want to assume, for example, when we're making a recommendation to a family that that child is going to want to grow up to identify as male and heterosexual and prefer vaginal intercourse. Mm -hmm. Um, and number two, because we also don't want to assume that adults who are coming to see us because they have some variation in their sex anatomy, that they have any other variation in their sense of themselves. So I think that's really important mm -hmm. to understand this is a distinct entity. Um, I think the other thing that's important for people to understand is this historical concept, this historical context rather of um, people feeling as though their uh, autonomy has been violated. Um, thinking very carefully about the concept of informed consent when we're making recommendations to, um, to families as well, so. In terms of teaching some of this content, mm -hmm. where in the trajectory of the medical education of a medical student, let's say, might one introduce these topics and how? I think that's a really excellent question and I, I think it's all, it's, there isn't a clear answer. The, the short answer is really where you have people who can teach the material. Um, so it really depends, depending on the institution, whether you're, the person with some expertise happens to be in genetics or endocrine or GYN, it really varies. And it's appropriate to include that, pre, that information preclinically in any of those disciplines. Um, the other place I think that it's a, an excellent opportunity to bring it up is when we're talking about the ethics of informed consent and shared decision making, which occurs preclinically and mm -hmm. clinically. And I think it's also worth thinking about including it in cultural competency courses just as you would LGBT and other gender and sexuality concerns. But ideally it would be something that occurs both preclinically and clinically and of course at the bedside should it come up. A lot of times when introducing material along these lines, it's very valuable to have people whose authentic experience mm -hmm. is in the realm that you're trying to teach about. Um, but I would think that it would be very important to protect individuals with DSD from uh, you know, being sort of put on show, mm -hmm. if you will. What sorts of precautions can educators take to avoid those kinds of experiences? So I, you know, there are a couple of ways that people can work around this. So if we're thinking about um, this occurring at the bedside, one of the things I think is a tremendous opportunity and many patients and families are willing to do are to sit down and speak with trainees at any level about what their experience is when everybody's fully clothed and sitting at a table, for example. Um, that's not part of the examination. Um, that I think empowers patients to feel like they can share this information and it's, I think in many ways, it's much more meaningful for the trainee to have a conversation with the patient than to just look at what their genitals look like. It, it, there's much more to that. Um, if we're thinking about this in a broader classroom-based approach, there are several documentaries and YouTube videos and um, there's actually one project in particular that's called the Interface Project where a series of um, adults with DSD have recorded videos of themselves, about 90 seconds each really, talking about what their experience has been. So there are tools online that people can use to bring some of these narratives into the classroom. Um, several support organizations, one of which I'm involved in is the Androgen and Sensitivity Syndrome DSD Support Group. Mm -hmm. 
um, has people who are willing to be speakers and if educators contact the support group we're able to send speakers to, to medical schools to give talks and many of us do that. that. That's wonderful and in terms of other resources that might be available to educators besides the, the stories mm -hmm. that you've mentioned and speakers from the Speakers Bureau, anything else mm -hmm. that you'd recommend? Sure, so there's, um, there's also a really neat pamphlet that was put together by a group of DSD affected teens that was called What We Wish Our Doctors Knew, mm. where they got together um, as part of an organization and compiled things that they wish their doctors knew about their experiences. So that's also sort of in the realm of patient narrative, certainly, um, but it's a different written tool that people can also, um, can also consider.